Hello and welcome to the History Hour podcast from the BBC World Service with me, Max Pearson. Next, we move forward in time and onto the streets of Liverpool in the English North West. In the early 1980s, the industrial and economic changes introduced by Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher had led to considerable social change and tension. In the summer of 1981, those tensions boiled over. During the riots that followed, police used CS gas to control civil unrest for the first time on the British mainland. Claire Bowes has been speaking to a man who took part in that rioting. Here come some of the cars out now. There are about three or four of them driving fast up the road. Liverpool 8, or Toxteth as it came to be known in the media, a run-down part of Liverpool with a mixed-race community, poor housing and few jobs. And just a lot of... Black smoke coming from one of the, the places down the In July 1981, it turned into a battlefield. The Grove Street area of Upper Parliament Street, there are actually a police in a rank there with their riot shields. The older residents of the area didn't understand why. And did you believe it would happen? No, 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 no. I would understand if, if they had some kind of row with the police. But the younger people knew. Jimmy Jagney was 17 when the riots broke out and he and his friends were afraid of the police. When he was just 12 and a keen student, he'd been stopped by police on his way home from school. And he asked me in a kind of gruff voice, you know, where I was going. I explained to him that I'd just come from school and I was on my way home. So anyway, he got out of the car and he walked towards me. And as he's walked towards me, he accused me of being a liar. He opened my bag, went through it, and he told me that I had to come with him to the police station. But instead, he drove Jimmy to some wasteland and racially abused him. He kept pointing out that kids like me needed to be removed from the street before we got old enough to break the law. And then he kicked me so that I fell over and I fell over into a pool of water. And then he picked up my bag and emptied the contents into the same pool of water. He got into the car laughing and then the two of them just drove off. Police at the time had the power to stop and search anyone they thought looked suspicious. In early July 1981, a young black man was arrested. There was a skirmish and three policemen were injured. The next day, the atmosphere in Toxteth was charged and there was a big police presence. By early evening, a full-scale battle had begun. There were lines of police with shields... And there were all these guys, there must have been about 150 to 200 guys just just, just throwing bricks from one side and, and, and charging with scaffolding, trying to penetrate the line of shields. There were vehicles burning everywhere. There were people running backwards and forwards. There were members of the press. There were community leaders who were recognised. There was a couple of priests and these flames licking high from these burning vehicles. And... People literally trying to kill each other. I mean, there were no holds barred. And I thought, what the hell is going on? And there were friends running backwards and forwards. The only response I get from was, come on, get down to the front, get down to the front. What are you doing standing here? I thought, no, I can't do this. It's an, you know, Because in <laughs> my mind, I'm, I'm not a violent kid. You know, I read books. <laughs> But then he spoke to a friend and asked him why he was joining in. You know, he just reminded me of all the grief that we've been through. And he explained to me, we'd just never, ever get an opportunity to show these guys, if you're going to make our lives hell, if we're going to end up in jail for walking on our streets, then let's go to jail for the right reason. And, and that's for sticking one on them first. I didn't relate to the solution, but I understood the sentiment because we feared every day. And I went to bed and I I, I slept on this. I ended up at some point convinced I can't not be with my friends going through this. Britain was a completely different place back then to what it is now. We had no one listening to us. It was up to us to take control of our fate. We had to do something. And now it was Sunday afternoon. And the two guys who'd been out the night before, they were geeing us up and saying, don't worry, don't don't be nervous, everyone looks out for everyone and, and don't be scared. We went out and I remember I was really frightened. I felt as though I was inviting all hell's trouble. Once I'd thrown my first few bricks, 
it all seemed to be natural you were amongst a lot of people who were all doing the same thing at the same time the police you were up really close to them and they were full of abuse it was us against them and made the strongest survive and then when the first petrol bombs started being thrown that really sorted out the men from the boys so to speak it was really horrible to see men on fire and it was really difficult seeing people in that sort of trouble and potentially the possibility of really really hurting someone possibly to the point of death it's true there was times when i had to think about that you know i was i was involved i i, I the only thing i didn't do was manufacture or throw molotov cocktails there were times when I was daredevil enough to go right up to the front line with a piece of scaffolding and start smashing on a shield. And if it got through the shield and it hit someone in a certain way, where it would hit them, it was of no consequence to me, it was of no concern to me. I'd blink on myself to it. I got involved. It wasn't until first light this morning that the full extent of the damage became known. Along Upper Parliament Street, where some of the worst rioting occurred, it looked like the morning after a Second World War blitz. Houses still smouldering, shops, offices burnt out. The next night, as the riots intensified, the police decided to use CS gas, tear gas, for the first time on the British mainland. It was around two o'clock in the morning. They fired the first CS canister. It landed on the corner of Catherine Street. A lot of smoke started to pour from it and it caught me. And I had to run off and to a house around the corner where I knew the family and I, I washed my face out my eyes. It was only the next day seeing the news that I realised the significance of it all. The chief constable of the local police force, Kenneth Oxford, explained why he'd taken this drastic step. It was a situation where I'd almost reached a point of overrunning or no return or call it what you will. I mean, these people had to be stopped and it was a last-ditch measure. There was one more night of rioting before it ended. Soon afterwards, the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, visited the area and spoke with some of the rioters to try to understand what had happened. It seemed like change might be on the way. The noises that the community leaders were making, they were trying to make it clear to, to anybody who'd listened that, you know, this was a police relations matter. It had nothing to do with unemployment, really. It had nothing to do with bad housing or poor education, really. Those things have been going on for since God's creation, but you didn't have riots every day. Um, so we felt as though this might pay off, you know, th things might change. Um, but the problem then was that over the next three weeks, eventually, police became more confident about coming back onto the streets. At the end of July, riots broke out again. This time, the police were more prepared. They began to break up the crowds using police vehicles. When a man was run over and killed, the riots ended. Over 450 police officers had been injured and 500 people arrested. It was, for the most part, a, a really frightening experience. It involved acts of behaviour on both sides, the likes of which I had never seen before or been a part of before. But I felt as though, like most of us felt, that there was so much at stake, it was unavoidable. There was an inquiry into this and other riots across the UK that year. The report criticised the police and the government and called for more community policing. Jimmy Jagney graduated from university and is now a community activist and teaching assistant. He still lives in Toxteth. Claire Bowes. Well, that type of rioting which took place on the streets of Liverpool in 1981 is pretty rare in Britain, but there are certain themes which crop up from time to time and result in similar tensions. They revolve around poverty, housing policing and occasionally summer heat. I'm joined now by Professor Richard Phillips of Sheffield University who's carried out research into the Toxteth riots. Just for the, a sense of the general context of what happened, the relationship between uh, the public and the police. We heard of Jimmy Jagney's appalling experience mm -hmm. being roughed up by a police officer. How common was that? Much more common than you'd like to think. I mean, the older person speaking in that interview was surprised by it and I would have been surprised by it myself from where I was in this country. But... Me and my colleagues in Liverpool spoke to a number of people who'd been involved in those disturbances. They also spoke of being battered by the police, of being taken 
down to the police station and held without charge. So how would you assess the blend of causes, if you like? Were, were these anti-police riots or was there also the, uh, the poverty, the deprivation, the housing uh, that fed into them? The easy answer is that it was poverty and it was housing and that was the answer that was most graspable by the government. So what Mrs Thatcher did at the time was to appoint uh, Michael Heseltine, the Environment Secretary, to go to Liverpool and to investigate and to visit places. She went herself, as was mentioned in that uh, report as well. But if you talk to people that were directly involved in the disturbances, those things were, were very much secondary. The thing that really upset people, that really provoked people to riot, was the way that they and their friends had been treated by the police. The Liverpool-born black community had been in the city for four generations. They've been there since the 1880s in one form or another, a mixed-race community. Um, so they're very, very much Liverpool, very much British. The only difference between this community and other people was their race. What was the result of the, the Heseltine uh, inquiry into what happened and the uh, attitude towards perhaps inner-city areas similar to Toxteth in other parts of Britain? Heseltine was focused on Merseyside. He came up with all sorts of plans uh, for environmental improvements, for detoxification, for investment. He launched the Merseyside Development Corporation, which came up with economic solutions. But the real inquiry into these issues wasn't really conducted by Michael Heseltine. It was conducted by Lord Scarman. Scarman really focused on race. He acknowledged that white people were involved as well. But he said that there was a lot of angry young men, and most of them, he said, were black. And he acknowledged that there was discrimination in policing. He acknowledged that there was disadvantage in black communities. He didn't accept the charge that there was institutional racism. That was a charge that wasn't accepted in relation to the police until 1999. But Lord Scarman went quite a long way, and he came up with a number of recommendations, including employing uh, more black minority ethnic community members in the police, uh, monitoring racial abuse, the sorts of things we heard about from Jimmy. Scarman wrote that report. He came back to look at whether that had made any difference a couple of years later. He wrote a postscript to it, and he concluded that in some ways it had. So what's Toxteth like now as compared with back then 35 years ago? There's a lot less unemployment than there was then. The city has had something of an economic revival, but... One thing that you'll notice if you go to Liverpool 8 is that there's quite a lot still of dereliction. There's a lot of, uh, of houses, of streets, which are being uh, demolished or waiting to be demolished. Professor Richard Phillips from Sheffield University and his book on the subject, co-written with Diane Frost, is entitled Liverpool 81.